Okay, thanks so much, uh, Johannes and Teresa, for inviting me to uh, li relive the uh, PTSD of my job market here. So I'll be talking about that paper uh, as well as some other work here with uh, Chris Hansman. So first, let me kind of talk about the overall agenda and what I've been trying to think about, which is what determines mortgage default? So this is a really important question because we saw millions of homeowners lose their homes over the course of the financial crisis. And we think that was a really big contributing factor to why that crisis was so bad for so many households in the economy. And right now we're also looking at a lot of household distress in the context of the COVID pandemic. And so we kind of want to understand, well, what determines household mortgage default behavior? To study that question, in both of these papers, we're going to look at adjustable rate mortgages and we're going to use identification coming from a divergence between indices, but we're going to address different parts of that question in different ways. So by looking at traditional ARM borrowers, we're going to be able to use interest rate variation, which shocks the actual payments the borrowers have to face, right? And that's going to result in variation that allows us to understand the cash flow impact of interest rate shocks on borrowers, as well as the spillover effects on local communities. And then for option arm borrowers, we're going to also use the same LIBOR treasury divergence, but that's going to impact balances and it's going to help us understand other aspects of how homeowners behave. So the kind of key results going to drive that are going to be that, you know, payment shocks do tend to result in borrowers defaulting. So it's not very surprising to know that borrowers that are kind of facing cash constraints and kind of contract shocks are defaulting as a consequence. We also find that defaults are triggering defaults among peers who in particular are going to be facing refinancing difficulties in the presence of local foreclosures and even shock to borrow leverage that don't have any impact on current payments also cause defaults. So overall, the picture of default, I kind of want you to take away, and I'll talk about this more at the end, is going to be a double trigger theory of mortgage default. So it's really the combination of a cash flow shock and the presence of negative equity, the strategic incentive to default, which is really driving mortgage defaults. So let me first start with a paper on foreclosure contagion here. And so to study this question, we're going to connect a few different data sources. So we're going to have deeds data that is going to be geocoded, which is nice. We know the exact location of homes. And so we're going to have this data on housing transactions. It's going to include foreclosures, refinancings uh, for a large administrative sample of you know, many homes. And for many of these properties, I'm going to connect this information to black box, which is going to be at the mortgage level and is going to have really detailed contract information. Um, and it's going to be really comprehensive of this private label securitized universe. So these are basically all the loans that were securitized, not by Fannie and Freddie. And this is a really important market for thinking about the crisis because this is really where so many of the problems started. And finally, we're going to have this Equifax data set that's linked in here as well, which is going to provide credit information. Uh, linked into these borrowers. So first, we're going to start with this sample of 5-1 ARMs. So these are going to be borrowers that have the following contract structure. For the first five years, they're going to be paying an initial rate that's fixed, after which they're going to change to be paying a market interest rate that's defined as the sum of a fixed margin term, in addition to the market index. And that index could have been LIBOR or Treasury. So let me just show you the variation in these two indices over here and the interest rate that borrowers are paying. So upon reset, the borrower is going to be paying whatever happens to be the market interest rate. And that, again, comes from either your LIBOR or your Treasury index. And kind of pre-crisis, the spread between these two indices really wasn't very large. This just wasn't a salient part of the contract choice that borrowers were facing about a fourth of the variation between which index you get kind of comes from the lender, but another fourth of it is variation within lender over time. But really this wasn't kind of a big part of the contract environment for either party. However, this large spread opens up over the course of the financial crisis, which means that borrowers that selected identical contracts within the same month are actually gonna be paying possibly very different interest rates and have very different payments for a length of time that's gonna be fixed for about a year after every time they reset. So borrowers, uh, you know, maybe not too surprisingly, borrowers don't really know which of the two they have, LIBOR or Treasury. If you ask borrowers, uh, only 25% of people tell you, num tell you something that could even possibly be correct. Like they'll tell you things like, I have you know, the CPI or the interest rate is my contract. My parents have an arm. Uh, I took a fair amount of digging just to figure out what was the actual index they were tied to. So in the first stage, we're going to look at how this variation in interest rate shocks affects default rates. In the second stage, we're going to look at the neighbors 
of those shocked individuals to look at how defaults causally impact the choices of people that live nearby. And really the key assumption is, is not that LIBOR and treasury borrowers are randomly assigned because we're actually gonna be able to control for whether you have a LIBOR or treasury loan, but that the interest rate spread, the variation in interest rates that's coming from the choice of index that varies over time is uncorrelated with neighbor responses aside other than through the channel of ARM default. Okay, and this gives you a little bit of sense of the variation we're talking about here. These are the sort of the distribution of LIBOR minus treasury interest rates. So you can see that, you know, especially for some borrowers, you have potentially quite large variation in the within month rate paid. This is kind of cool because it's very rare that you're actually able to get cross-sectional variation in interest rates almost by definition, right? You know, you usually think of there as being kind of one risk-free rate and any variation in interest rates is kind of coming from some sort of risk pricing. But here, because of the choice of market index, we're able to get actually pretty substantial shocks to interest rates that borrowers are paying. So what we're gonna do is construct a sample of neighbors of ARM borrowers. So these ARM borrowers, right, are being shocked because they're paying higher interest rates just because of their choice of index. And then we're gonna look and see how are the neighbors responding because they're now going to be faced with a local default, a local foreclosure in their neighborhood, which is gonna affect a lot of different choices that they're kind of making about their uh, defaulting choice. So specifically what we're gonna do is look at a whole bunch of different borrowers and we're gonna geocode these so we know how far they are away from each other. We're gonna look at adjustable rate mortgages. And in this example here, you can think of there being uh, a radius around each of the properties that we're gonna focus on 0.1 miles. So pretty tight, narrow window around the uh, properties that are resetting. And we're gonna be kind of comparing time periods like July, 2007, when there was not that much of a difference between the interest rates faced by treasury and LIBOR borrowers against time periods like January, 2009, when there was a much larger difference in the interest rates, right? And so this difference means that the LIBOR borrowers in the high reset rate environment are faced with a much higher interest rate. That's gonna result in higher default rates. And also it's gonna mean that the neighbors, the people who live in this neighborhood are going to be systematically faced with higher neighborhood default rates that's just coming from other people's contract choice, nothing about their own behavior. So in the first stage, we're looking at the defaults of individual borrowers in response to the shock that comes from re, uh, post reset interest rates that are deriving from the index. In the second stage, we're gonna be looking at how neighbors are responding to those defaults. We're able to control here uh, for a lot of characteristics of the borrowers, including whether or not the mortgage was ARM or uh, was LIBOR or treasury itself. And this is really a key result. So we see that in the first stage, we're gonna have shocks to interest rates are driving defaults for affected borrowers. So people that are, uh, who, or people who are facing higher interest rate shocks are defaulting more themselves. So this is maybe not so surprising that payment shocks drive borrower default behavior. But then when we look at the second stage and the IV of how do those neighbor defaults impact others, we see that neighbors who live nearby people that are facing these resets also default more. So if you aggregate up within the whole neighborhood, uh, uh, neighborhood area, we find that each foreclosure causes an additional 0.45 foreclosures in the neighboring area. So there's this contagion knock-on effect by which foreclosures affect the default propensities of other people that live in the area in the vicinity of foreclosures. So we look at this effect kind of across distance uh, it kind of seems to really kind of steadily decay. So that sort of suggests that this really is a very hyper-local effect of foreclosures affecting neighbors. And uh, when we look at what kind of other behaviors those neighbors are doing, one thing we see is that the demand for refinancing, so the demand for new credit by those neighbors is not going up. It's, it's just kind of remaining basically flat. So these are mortgage inquiries. So this is how much those borrowers on their credit reports are demanding kind of new credit. Uh, sort of an indication of demand for uh, per prepayments, but we see that actual prepayments are really plummeting, right? So this is the refinancing propensity for people that live in the neighborhood of resetters. And this is showing that those people are really getting refinancings substantially less often. So that tells you that there's an impact of foreclosures on credit availability in the vicinity of the neighborhoods surrounding, uh, surrounding those defaults, surrounding those foreclosures. So 
kind of putting some of these results together, you know, what do we kind of take away from this analysis about how these interest rate shocks affect neighborhoods? So I think, you know, the conclusion I kind of came to after, you know, working on this for a while is that there was certainly something kind of like a bank run going on here. So usually we think of bank runs as being borrowers running on banks because people are leaving their deposits or checking accounts and so on with banks and deciding to run on the bank or not. But banks themselves are also making loans to other people potentially in a short-term basis. So what's going on with these ARM contracts is they most commonly have this feature, this hybrid feature where you've got an initial teaser rate, right? We just talked about here, followed by some sort of reset. And what was happening over the course of the crisis is that many borrowers are basically just refining constantly. So you have a two-year arm, refi that into another three-year arm. And it was really the sequence of continued refinancings that was enabling people to kind of continue affording their loans. But that put the bank in, in the following situation in which they were able to deny access, deny refinancing access to borrowers um, if they chose not to extend that refinancing, which would force borrowers to then face the higher interest rate costs of the post reset. And so basically what happened in 2007 is a lot of borrowers found themselves in a state space where house prices were falling, interest rates were going up, and they were faced with these resets and the bank was denying credit. When that happened, they were kind of faced with these higher payment shocks that led to defaults as we've talked about. And then it had these aggregate knock-on consequences due to the fire sale externalities in local areas. So part of that includes a direct price channel by which foreclosures affect prices of local properties, but it also reflects a few other channels. So one has to do with appraisals, right? So neighboring properties, as they try to refinance, are going to get an appraisal in order to value the property. And the appraisal process wound up often including the price of that foreclosed neighboring property itself, which might sell for something like a 50% discount. So good luck trying to refinance a property in the midst of the housing crisis when the house next to you is dropped by 50% in value. Your appraisal is going to say, no way we're giving you any refinancing. And that kind of exposed borrowers to really facing the true shock of that rate hike, kind of the bank running on the borrower, forcing them to pay this higher cost of credit. In addition, I think, I think I find suggestive evidence that there was also some role for peer effects here. Borrowers kind of living in the vicinity of defaulting homes are reassessing the propensity of strategic default. All of that kind of tells us that there is a place-based component to how borrowers are making default choices that they're responding causally to default in their very hyper-local neighborhood, and they're taking that information, they're responding by the differential response of market credit in their own default behavior, which is an important amplification mechanism for shocks during the crisis itself. Okay, so that was sort of a drive-by of uh, my job market paper. Uh, I wanna kind of get to this other paper here on moral hazard selection, which is going to also use that same LIBOR treasury variation but in order to understand slightly distinct questions, uh, we're still reading the crisis. So the motivating kind of fact here is that there's a very strong relationship between leverage, here measured as something like loan to value, so size of loan divided by the balance at the time of origination, and default, right? So these are a sample of um, option R mortgages that we'll look at. And just to give you a sense of how kind of severe this crisis was, you can see the fraction of borrowers defaulting is really coming into the 40s, 50s, and 60s here for many of these borrowers, right? So there's a very high default propensity among these borrowers that's strongly increasing in leverage. So why is that? Why is it the case that higher leverage borrowers are actually defaulting more? Well, there are basically two channels that have to do with information asymmetries. One is that it could be moral hazard. So higher balances causally induce borrowers to default on their mortgages because they have a higher balance, they have more leverage. Or it could be adverse selection. It could be the riskier borrowers are taking on more leverage. And as a consequence, they're more likely to face default, right? So this is a kind of a classic problem that you're commonly going to face with disentangling these information symmetries is how to separate out moral hazard from adverse selection. It's very complicated here because different choices of leverage, different ex ante choices of leverage are also going to result in ex post different balances. And so it's difficult to disentangle which of these two channels is operating. So let's kind of first talk about like what would be an ideal experiment to try to separate these two channels, right? So think about two borrowers that have taken out identical loans and let's say their loan is $100,000. Now suppose that we have some sort of shock and borrower A now has a higher balance than borrower B, right? So there's some sort of shock that exposes the borrower to higher balance realization than the other. So 
What that's going to mean is that if we observe then a higher default propensity by borrower A than borrower B, we know it's the higher balance that's causally driving the default, right? Because they were taking identical loans ex ante, and it's just some sort of shock that results in a difference in balance that's then driving the default behavior. So that's kind of an ideal experiment here to think about moral hazard, some sort of exhaustion shock to the balance. Let's think about some sort of ideal experiment to think about adverse selection. So in this example, we're going to have two different borrowers, C and D. They actually have taken ex ante different contracts. So borrower C has taken out higher leverage ex ante. But as a result of the exogenous shock, they now have the same balance. So if two borrowers now have the identical balance ex post, but actually selected into different contracts ex ante, then observing higher defaults among borrower C, even when they face the same balance, is going to suggest that there's selection, that borrower C entered into this contract with different propensities for default relative to uh, this borrower D. So this kind of gives you a flavor of the identification strategy here, right? We're kind of approximating this ideal experiment with, with these option R mortgages. So what's unique about this adjustable rate mortgage contract structure is that you really only pay you're only required to pay a very small initial payment, and a very small payment that actually leaves you negatively amortizing. Instead, your balance will accrue based on whether you're indexed to LIBOR or Treasury, but you're not actually forced to pay that every single month. Again, your forced required payments are just a very minimal payment schedule. What LIBOR and Treasury shocks do in this context is they only flow through to your balance, right? They only increase the total amount that you have to pay but they don't result in immediate cash flow shocks. And so for this reason, we kind of have a very clean experiment that allows us to assess the role of interest rate shocks that affect balances on bar behavior, allowing us to approximate that ideal experiment. Now, this market for option arms uh, was actually a pretty substantial one before the financial crisis, about 10% of originations. And it means that we're going to have balances that depend on the realizations of these index which means that identical borrowers with different index realizations are going to have different balances. That's going to allow us to measure moral hazard. And borrowers that actually took on ex ante different contracts faced with uh, index realizations might actually face the same balances, allowing us to test for adverse selection. So uh, this using the same you know, LIBOR treasury variation as before, but it's basically giving us variation here in terms of the overall balance that borrowers are being exposed to that doesn't impact their kind of cash flow immediate realization. And so the specification we're going to run here is we're interested, again, in understanding default, but we're going to basically instrument for your LTV using this LIBOR treasury instrument. And it's going to allow us to causally measure how much changing just your balance is going to impact default behavior. That's the moral hazard part, as well as how important was the original leverage. So how important, how important is sorting of different risky borrowers across different contract types ex ante in explaining default behavior? Uh, one other detail that we do to implement this in practice, uh, we use a leave out mean strategy. So we take borrowers that have selected contracts and we actually measure the leverage that all other borrowers in their contract um, have picked and use the neighbors, uh, or not the neighbors, the, uh, the other contract uh, to kind of predict your own balance realization. This is just a jackknife instrument for the LTV um, that allows us to use variation in um, balance realization just coming from the contract choice LIBOR versus treasury. So we you know, regress our kind of instrument here, this leave out uh, instrument against a whole bunch of uh, observable variables, you know, don't really seem to find much, suggesting that this kind of seems to be a reasonably exogenous instrument for understanding uh, borrow propensities. And this is kind of the key regression here where we're trying to understand the impact of leverage on borrower default. So we're going to start with a baseline kind of correlation, which is that borrowers with 10 points higher in LTV are defaulting about 10 percentage points a year more. Then when we break it down into the IV, we're going to basically instrument for your leverage using this LIBOR treasury leave out mean, which means that we're using variation in leverage that's just coming from the contract choice, that's just coming from the balance realization that you're exposed to. And then we've got some residual variation on the origination leverage, which reflects the role of adverse selection here, right? Because we've got a causal instrument for the instrument. And so we've, the residual variation on origination leverage, we're going to interpret as reflecting adverse selection. What this sort of tells us is about 60% of the association between leverage and default that we saw initially 
can be attributed to something like adverse selection, suggesting that riskier borrowers were selecting onto those higher leverage contracts. And about 40% of this reflects moral hazard, this channel by which higher leverage, even higher leverage that doesn't come with any concurrent cash flow shocks, increases borrower defaults as well. This allows us to decompose those two information asymmetries into a moral hazard and adverse selection channel. Find that both are kind of important. Adverse selection just a little bit, a uh, little bit more important here. So I think this figure is, is kind of was really nice for me in thinking about how to interpret our results and put them in the context of the broader literature. So we're measuring here is this leave out mean of loan to value. So what we're doing is you know leaving out the borrower, looking at all the other leverage realizations for borrowers with that same choice of index and for the same month. And then we're looking at the outcome of default here. So what this is sort of showing is that as borrowers are sort of instrumented to have higher levels of default or higher levels of leverage, they're more likely to default in a nonlinear way, right? So especially once you kind of cross 100 LTV, you kind of see a flattening out of the slope here, whereas it's kind of quite steep before that. So I think this, this sort of helps us, you know, put our results into context with some of the other papers in the literature. Um, I think you'll see Ganoeng and Newell later today. They're looking at an experiment where they shock people, where they look at people who have entered into mortgage default plans and have seen a reduction in their principal payments that takes them from being very negative equity to being somewhat negative equity and find that doesn't really do much to reduce their propensity for default. So that's very consistent with our results here. So once we kind of get into the negative equity territory, there's not much additional causal effect of leverage in moving people into default. So that's a very important fact to know for how to target principal reduction programs. However, our sample allows us to measure the impact of leverage at all points of the distribution, right? And we find that just kind of moving, increasing leverage, even leverage again in our context, doesn't lead to any cash flow shocks for borrowers, does increase their propensity for, for default as we move them closer to being in negative equity. So we find overall this you know, strong correlation between loan size and default. Borrowers that are 10 points higher in their loan to value are defaulting at about 10 percentage points more per year. Um, and we're able to decompose that, controlling for kind of payments into two channels, find about 60% of that is adverse selection, 30, 40% of that is moral hazard. The causal estimation of default here, even among borrowers that have a rise in leverage without any impact on their payment shock. So what I kind of want to do now is basically try to kind of reconcile all these results into kind of a broader theory for how to make sense of mortgage default. And, you know, this is sort of a two by two that I, I sort of show my, my students here, which is that mortgage default is, I think, really a double trigger situation. What that means is two things need to happen for borrowers generally to wind up in mortgage default. One is they have a life event, right? And that can be an idiosyncratic shock, like a health shock, such as cancer diagnoses I've looked at in other work. It can come from the contract structure itself if they face a cash flow payment shock resulting from you know, resetting in the mortgage contract. And in addition, they have to generally be in negative equity. So they have to face the strategic incentive to also wind up in default, right? So once you're in negative equity, it becomes more profitable for you to actually walk away from your property. Now, borrowers that are in negative equity but haven't received a life shock, you know, can, you can think of those as sort of ruthlessly strategic defaulters, borrowers that are kind of walking away from the property, though they've suffered no shock whatsoever. It doesn't actually seem like those borrowers are very common. Instead, it seems like what really happened in the financial crisis was that lots of borrowers receiving enormous shocks that are coming from things like unemployment, things from, like, things from their contract itself in context in which house prices are really falling and they're put into positions of negative equity. We can identify, causally identify the role of the adverse shock by looking at these you know, cross-sectional shocks that come from interest rate variation based on index. And we can causally identify the negative equity itself by looking at these exogenous balance shocks to option arm borrowers. Now the precise trigger point, where exactly you default conditional on receiving one of these background shocks seems to vary across borrowers. It seems like borrowers that are quicker to default, that have they're kind of kind of faster to pull that trigger, are generally picking higher leverage contracts. So we identified that adverse selection based on the sorting of borrowers in the experiment we just did. And it also seems like borrowers are changing their triggers based on the availability of external financing, so the availability of uh, getting a refinancing of their loan, as well as peer effects. So what, what borrowers are doing around them in their local neighborhood, reflecting the basic norms around debt repayment 
right? The more the norm sort of sustain repay your debts, the more likely it is that borrowers are going to continue to repay their debts even as they enter into negative equity. Whereas if those norms degrade, you see borrowers more quick to exercise their default option and walk away from the properties um, as they enter into this double shock region of the uh, state space here with negative equity and background cash flow shocks. Okay, so that's basically the two papers I have, both kind of about using interest rate shocks uh, coming from LIBOR treasury differences to try to identify different aspects of how borrowers default in the mortgage. Last kind of thing I'll say real quick about the COVID pandemic is, I think it kind of supports this basic framework because you're seeing lots of borrowers that have meaningful kind of income shocks that are really affecting them, but many of these borrowers are in positions of positive equity. And so they're able to refinance, sell their home, walk away from it, or you know, do something without walking away from the property in ways that have really been mitigating the extent of foreclosure that we've seen in this crisis so far. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a real pleasure to uh, share this with you, and I'll be sure to be back here for the Q&A later today. Yeah, thank you. So, so I guess two things. So first of all, um, you, know, to, you know, to all the students, I um, just want to remind you, if you have a question that you would like to ask up it, um, just put it in the Q&A and, you know, we'll try and group questions and sort of bring up common themes across the presentations um, later on. I also just wanted to highlight sort of the many common themes between the things that, you know, Arpit talked about and sort of across the various sessions that we've been running. So I think one sort of common theme that keeps showing up across all of these is just the role of peer effects and social interaction. So if you think about Arpit's first paper, you know, the fact that um, these, um, you know, these defaults in your very local neighborhood have this effect on you that goes beyond just the effect on prices or something, you know, I, I, I think Alpit is careful in his, in his writing to not like attribute a specific peer effect mechanism to, you know, to, to, to those effects. But I think, you know, that there, there obviously seems to be something um, going on that's very consistent with, you know, some of the stuff we saw from Jordan Nickerson and, and, and so on, you know, about how in the mortgage market peer effects are really very important. I mean, the second theme that keeps showing up throughout the class and, you know, again, um, I want to just, you know, in some sort of compliment up it on sort of, you know, the, the research design there is just, just the, the, the asymmetric information you know, in credit markets, it's just both moral hazard and adverse selection are sort of, you know, everywhere. And, and, and they're more important in household finance credit markets, I think, than they are even in sort of corporate credit markets, because households are even more opaque and even harder for banks to value. And so um, the challenge that, that, you know, we've seen in the papers that have tried to address, um, you know, the role of, you um, uh, you know, information asymmetries in these house, household finance markets is, is, you know, it's just an identification and measurement challenge. And so, you know, I think Arbit's paper, the second paper with with, with uh, Hansman is one, I think a great example of a paper that sort of uses a really clever research design to help us not just show the role of, of asymmetric information in general, but really of trying to, you know, separately identify moral hazard from adverse selection, which, um, which you know, is, is, as you saw, even more tricky than just you know, showing the role of, of information um, asymmetries more general. Um, the other thing that 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 you know the, this research design on on mortgage resets um, that Alpit is using in both of the papers is one that I think I just want to highlight for you as one that that you know other researchers have also used subsequently or contemporaneously, etc. And it is just an extremely powerful research design that. Um, you know, that I think is, is, is worth paying attention to, you know, it's very, very hard to get um, quasi random variation in the interest rate that people pay, right? Because normally, you know, for good reasons, the interest rate that you pay depends on your risk profile, right? The bank looks at you, they'll look how risky you are. And then, you know, the more risky you are, you know, the higher interest rates you end up paying. And so it's very, very hard if you're trying to get at identifying the causal effect of interest rates on outcomes. Um, you know, it's very hard to get good variation. And I think this idea of saying, look, you know, when, when people took out that mortgage in 2004, they had very, you know, they basically no one knew what the reset rate was. And it was very unclear whether or not in 2008 or nine, LIBOR or treasuries or whatever it would be, would kind of be higher or lower than the other thing. Um, like using that, I think is, is extremely powerful. And so, you know, you've seen up it using it in two applications, you know, there is a there's, you know, there's other work on looking at the causal effect on consumption, you know, of interest payments on consumption that uses this as well. Um, Sasha and Data's job market paper, um, you know, uses variations of it. So I just want to highlight this, you know, as you're trying to look for research designs 
to give you causal variation, these mortgage reset research designs are a, you know, are a pretty good, um, a pretty good starting point. Um, Teresa, you already, you also wanted to mention something. No, I think, I mean, I, yeah, I just think Aubrey's paper just says like, it has this really nice identification. And I remember our quick being from the job market and we all really like- Teresa, you have to put your microphone down. Otherwise we basically can't hear you. Sorry, yep. <laughs> I, put, I put it up. Uh, no, I just want to say, you know, I think Upper's job market paper, like, you know, he obviously was very successful on the job market because I think it's just an example of a really important question and a nice, clever design. Um, that that ultimately made this paper very successful. Yeah. Here's one thing I'll put that I just, uh, it, it, I had the sense that that paper shifted in focus a little bit over time so that, you know, the relative emphasis you put, you know, the, the, the published version has, um, say on the peer effect stuff is slightly different to the relative emphasis. So sort of the job market paper version had, I, I think maybe there's some interesting sort of, you know, comments or insights you have for the students on sort of that process and, you know, kind of what, what made you shift? How did you realize what you, you know, what other people thought was going to be the most interesting aspects of the paper? Yeah, I, I think I just presenting the paper and then getting it through the reviewing process actually came to a very different understanding of what, what I, what I, what I thought that I, that I found. And um, I, I actually really wish I was able to do more on getting information about appraisal specifically. I think it's a it's a particular channel of how prices are going to impact borrowers through this through this uh, through this kind of role of kind of the supply side and the credit channel. That some, is something that just the, re the referees really picked up on. Um, something a lot, a lot of comments I got got and uh, but in general that kind of feedback is something that I really took to heart and tried to use to kind uh, of reshape the paper. Yeah, I think even in the title, you know, that kind of reflects, you know, the, reflects some of the some of the changing focus. So I think, you know, I guess one lesson for you know for the PhD students is that, um, you know, you should be open throughout the you know throughout the process of writing the paper. Um, you know, like sometimes the same sets of results can lead to you know can 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 be emphasized and written up in sort of very very different ways, and and you know what ends up being the biggest contribution or, you know, what, what people sort of find the most interesting takeaway from your work doesn't always correlate perfectly with what you yourself might think, you know, the first time you present this, um, you know, to, to be the most, uh, the biggest contribution. And so I think being open to sort of changes over time and in, 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 in you know, emphasizing certain things more, maybe de-emphasizing some other thing, I think is, is, is sort of a very valuable thing. Um, that um, that you know we all we all do every time with every paper you know you start realizing in the process of talking to other people you know where do their eyes light up and where do their eyes glaze over and so you kind of get a sense of emphasizing the things where people get excited about and de-emphasizing the things where people get bored with and so I think that that's that's something that you know I've certainly seen with your paper sort of very starkly between the job market and the and the published version but it really happens with all of our works um, and it, it it's something you know we should all be open to. Okay, great. Thanks so much for having me here. Thank you, Arpit. So we'll see you at five. So we'll take a, you know, we'll take a five minute um, break and then we're back um, with Claudia Robles Garcia um, talking about her job market paper. So I think today, actually, interestingly enough, we'll have a lot of job market paper. I think Matteo Benetton's presentation is also going to be on his job market paper. I presented my job market paper, though, you know, that's a longer time ago than some of the others. Um, but, um, but I think, um, you know, that the reason for this is, I think, precisely the motivation I gave in the beginning, that a lot of the researchers in this space were sort of people who were in graduate school, either during or just after the, the financial crisis, where really, you know, we realized mortgage markets are important to understand and were sort of, you know, dramatically understudied relative to that. So you can see, you know, that, that kind of explains why I think a lot of the sort of important contribution in this literature, actually job market papers, because this is really, you know, something that you know, graduate students are kind of seeing in real time that this market is important and understudied. Um, 